Hello and welcome. Thank you all for arriving early this morning. We're excited for this Easter service, last night's service, and this morning first service was wonderful, and you guys are in for a wonderful experience as we prepare to worship Jesus Christ. Just want to encourage you, every seat is going to be needed this morning. We're expecting a full house, so if you could do your best to help us by scooting closer to your neighbor on your right or your left. Something that might help you break the ice as you do that is just turn to your neighbor and tell them Happy Easter if you haven't already done that. But please help us by squeezing next to your neighbor. We're going to need every seat in here today. Thank you, and use this last couple minutes, too, as we get ready to start, to prepare your hearts to worship Jesus Christ and celebrate his resurrection. He was the first, the first one who really saw us, not past us. He stopped and spoke with us, he ate with us, laughed with us. We were nobodies, but not when we were with him. When he told us of a new world, a coming kingdom, we could see it. Then, it all ended. We were the last to see him alive. We will be the first to visit his tomb. Friday, we prepared spices. Saturday, we waited. Now Sunday morning is here. 
and we are nearly there. But as we get closer, we see that something is not right. Something feels strange. No ground begin to shake. The stone was broken. celebrate today. Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on, let's say we believe in Jesus Christ today. Believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus. Heaven. I 
Lord, for the life that Jesus Christ gives us. We thank you, Lord. Let's sing this together. We'll never be ashamed. We'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away?
still stands, the blood still flows, the work is finished, hell still knows, yes it does, that the grave is still empty, stone is still Church. My name is Devin. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I oversee our middle school and high school ministries. And on behalf of our entire team, thank you so much for joining us this Easter. We are so glad that you're here. And if I might say so, you all look fabulous. Like, you look amazing. You look like you could take a family photo right now, like maybe like an Instagram-worthy, even a fridge-worthy family photo. I hope you take one today. I hope it's the best family picture you've ever taken. I hope that your Easter plans work out amazingly, and I hope that your roast is cooked to perfection, or whatever you're cooking today. But more than anything, my prayer for you and your family is that today you would be filled with a renewed hope, because despite what you might be facing in life, the powerfully beautiful truth that we celebrate this morning is that Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. And because he's alive, that changes everything. As you came in this morning, you should have found this handout in your seat. We would love for you to fill it out. The bottom portion is our connection card. And especially if you're new, we would love for you to take a chance to fill that out so that we can get to know you, connect with you, and help connect you to our church. But even if you're not new, our connection card is the best way to share prayer requests and take some next steps that you'll find on the back of that connection card. And one next step that I would love for you to consider taking today is attending Starting Point. Starting Point is the perfect next step for you if you're looking to find out more about our church and get more involved. Whether you've been around for a while or you're brand new, this is the perfect next step for you. Our next Starting Point is happening on Sunday, April the 14th after our second service. Lunch will be provided, child care is available, and we'll take about an hour of your time to tell you more about who we are and how you can be a bigger part of it. You can sign up for that online or by checking the box right on the back of that connection card. After you've filled that card out, you can tear that bottom portion off and drop it in any one of our giving boxes in the lobby. 
In just a moment, we're gonna get into our Easter message for the morning, but before we do, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, thank you so much just for the opportunity to gather here and worship. Thank you for allowing us just the chance to reflect on what you have done for us. Thank you for the cross of Christ that literally does change everything for us. Thank you that because you died, Jesus, I can live. Because you conquered death, I can live in victory and freedom. And thank you, Father, as we prepare to hear a story that perhaps we've heard dozens, if not hundreds of times, that you would allow our minds to be open, our hearts to be ready to hear whatever it is that you would teach us today so that we can grow closer to you. God, we love you, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. today we celebrate the greatest event in the history of the world, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Can we praise God today for that? Woo. Well, whether you're new with us or you've been here for a while, I'm so grateful that you've decided to, to celebrate the resurrection uh, with us this weekend. I'm Josh. I'm one of the pastors here if we haven't had a chance uh, to meet. And I just want to take a moment and thank all of our incredible volunteer leaders that are serving during all four of our services this weekend. Can we thank them for all they do every weekend? Uh, and this service is a little extra special. My parents, Jimmy and Jennifer, are here from South Carolina worshiping with us. Can you guys welcome them? We're so glad you're here. Mom and Dad, thankful that you're here. Um, if you have a Bible or a phone, you can join me in John chapter 20. It'll also be on the, the screen behind me. Well, we've already sang some incredibly hopeful songs today. We've got some amazing lights and the flowers and uh, the beautiful cross as we come into the room. Uh, some of us are wearing a new shirt today like me. Some, how, many, how many of you guys today, you, know, you got a new shirt on? Come on, somebody. You, know, you look good. Uh, you have a new outfit, whatever it might be. Uh, but you know, when you think about it, uh, whether it's uh, the, the reality that chocolate is everywhere, and for that we say, amen, amen. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have a good idea of what I'm probably going to talk about today. It's not going to be a, a real big um, surprise. I mean, spoiler alert, right? Jesus died on the cross, but three days later, he rose again. And we praise God for that, and we never get used to that. But the first Easter Sunday morning was very different than 2024. There, there were no pastel colors. There were no family dinner plans. There was no resurrection songs. I mean, the disciples were huddled up in their homes, afraid and discouraged and scared to death. I mean, just think about what had just happened. Just days earlier, Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey as the crowds were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And as he came into the city, there was much happening, and later that week, Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' own disciples, betrayed him and sold him to the Romans to be taken into custody as a, as a criminal. And Jesus was put on trial, although he was completely innocent. And the angry mob yelled out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate was really not 
for it. He, he wanted to wash his hands of this whole event because he had never seen this type of thing happen up to that point. And Jesus was taken and when he was beaten and mocked and whipped and disgraced. And he carried the cross to Golgotha, which is called the place of the skull. And he was nailed to a cross because of his great love for you and for me. And as he breathed his last, he cried out, to Tetelestai, which means it is finished. Which means paid in full. It means it's complete. And as he died, an earthquake occurred. And the, the, the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Meaning that now there is no barrier between us and God through what Jesus did on the cross. And Joseph of Arimathea came and he took Jesus' body off of the cross and they wrapped him and began to put him into the tomb. They rolled a large stone across the mouth of the barrel cave and they walked away thinking that the movement of Jesus was over. The, the, the Pharisees, Pilate, the soldiers, even the soldiers that were placed to guard the tomb, they probably all thought the whole scenario was done. Even his disciples thought that it, it was over. Satan and all of his demons thought that they'd finally put an end to Jesus Christ once and forever. But Sunday was coming. And in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Now the other gospel accounts tell us that there was not just one woman at the tomb, there was Many women, Joanna, Su Susanna, Salome, and Mary, the mother of James. And what I love about the resurrection story is that the ladies find out the news that he ain't in there anymore. How many ladies are a little excited about that today? Come on. And it's interesting that as Mary sees the empty tomb, she knew, if you study first century history, grave robbing was a big deal. People would ransack graves. And now she's in this moment of grief. Now remember, Mary was one of the Marys, not only Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was also next to Jesus' mother, watching him die. And she's grieving. Not only has he died, but now they've taken him away. And I recognize, you know, we come into Easter services, we have awesome colors, pastel shirts, chocolate. We've got all these things that, that scream joy and hope. But if we're honest, there's many of us today that are grieving. Some of us have lost someone. Some of us are hurting today because of a prognosis. Some of us are hurting because of a relationship. And some of us are here because your grandmother said, you better come to church on Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> but Mary's in this moment, along with the other women, saying, not only did he die, but now we don't know where he is. In verse 3, it says that that, after she tells the disciples that he's not in the tomb, it says that that Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. In verse 4, it says the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Now, this is just a fun moment for me. Now, when it says the other disciple, John is talking about himself, right? This is the gospel of John. And John, just like most men, just wants to go ahead and historically record the fact that he outran Peter to the tomb. <laughs> I, John the Apostle. And not only that, throughout his, his amazing account of Jesus' ministry, he always calls himself the one who Jesus loved. Is there anybody that considers themselves the favorite child, you know, of the family, you know? My mom, you always tell us, you're my favorite second born. I'm always like, ha ha, oh, that's nice. Thank you, mom, for doing that. Notice what happens, right? John beats him to the tomb, and look at verse 5. Stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but notice, John did not go in. Then, following him, he just make, makes another reminder that Peter was behind him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. So, so John records not only did, was Peter the first loser, but notice who goes into the tomb first? 
Peter, what a Peter move, right? If you know anything about Peter, he was a barging in kind of guy. John won the race, but Peter went into the tomb first. Verse 7 says, The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. Now, now why does John record this detail? Not only that he's faster than Peter, but, but why the linen cloths? Now, it's interesting, if you want to get into the weeds on this, many theologians believe that where Jesus' body had been laid on the, on the stone, it was literally still in the same shape as his body, because she just went, ping, he was just out of there. Which, which basically refutes all of the lies that his body was stolen, because if his body was stolen, it would have been a mess. But notice, the wrapping that was around the head of Jesus was folded up. What does that tell us? Um, I think there's many things we could pull from that. Not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but he made his mom proud, and he's folded his clothes on the way out. <laughs> Come on. Some of y'all are going to use that on your kids now. Remember, Jesus folds his clothes. But it's interesting that according to Jewish custom in the first century, if you were invited over to someone's house, and if they treated you with hospitality and kindness, the custom was that after dinner, you would take the napkin and you would crumple it up really good, and you'd leave it on the plate as if to say, thank you, this is wonderful, my Yelp review is off the charts, thank you for your hospitality. But if you went over to the house and they were not hospitable or kind, one of the customs was to fold the napkin very neatly and leave it on the plate, as if to say, I won't be coming back. You could say Jesus folded clothes and said, I won't be coming back into a tomb anymore. Amen. You can praise God for that. I love verse 8. It says, the other disciple who, notice, John wants to remind us again, who had reached the tomb first, <laughs> then also went in, saw, and believed. Verse 9, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. And here's what's interesting, right? We're on this side of the resurrection story. Jesus had told his disciples over and over again, hey guys, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to rise again. All the time. I mean, really, they should have been at the tomb on the third day going, guys, 10, 9, 8, 7. But no, what were they doing? They were hiding. They were afraid. But now it's sinking in that there, there could be a possibility that Jesus is alive. And as they head home, they're processing all they had seen and wondering if it was really true. And so today I want to take some time and show us how the empty tomb changes everything. Because Jesus is alive, not only does it affect the way we do our calendars, more importantly, the empty tomb changes people from being dead in their sin to being alive in Christ. Amen. And so we're going to walk through this today. If you want to jot a few of these down, the first truth is this. Because of the empty tomb, our past has been forgiven. You see, friends, because of the cross and the re resurrection, death was defeated and new life is available through Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, our sin and our past has been completely forgiven. And it's interesting, as the other disciples head back home, the Bible records that Mary stays back. Verse 11 says, But Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she's outside the tomb and she's weeping. She takes another peek into the tomb, processing, probably thinking to herself, what, what do we do now? And you might ask the question, why is she staying back? And really, if we're honest, who, who is Mary Magdalene? I mean, if you look, look her up online or you Google her name, there's been much said about Mary Magdalene. Books and movies. Books and movies that have been written to actually not only give a lot of weird thoughts about her, but actually to, to remove the, the divinity of Jesus itself. Well, her name, Magdalene, comes from her hometown, the town of Magdala. Everybody say Magdala. It's a pretty cool place. You can visit it today. It's a fishing town on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Just a few years ago, they excavated a first century tem uh, temple where they believe Jesus preached out of. 
And so before Mary ever met Jesus, she was far from God. What we do know about Mary is found in Luke chapter 8, verse 2. As Jesus was preaching the good news in her town, it says, Mary called Magdalene, seven demons had come out of her. Now, let, let's just pause for a moment. And I want you to imagine how chaotic her life must have been before she ever heard the name Jesus. But as he came into her town, preaching the good news, telling them about a coming kingdom that is not of this world, Mary was distressed. I mean, imagine the nightmare that she was living every day, being under the oppression and, and, and the attack of, the, of Satan himself. But when she met Jesus that day, as he cast those demons out of her body, can you imagine the light of the hope of the gospel that came into her mind and her heart? That that day when she was hearing this message and hearing the forgiveness and the power of the love of God, she was now forgiven and set free. I want to remind us once again today that there is power in the name of Jesus, and no matter how dark it gets, he wins. Amen. See, Mary encountered the one that had all power over death, hell, and the grave. And so here's what I, I think we can say about her, and I could probably say about a lot of us. When we've been forgiven much, we love him back much. Why was she at the tomb? I think because she was so grateful for the change that he brought in her life. She went from lost to being found, and now she's living a life of devotion and gratitude, and she just wants to honor his body. She just wants to know, where did they take him? Verse 12 says this in John 20, she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you crying? Well, because they've taken away my Lord. Notice she doesn't say the Lord, she says my Lord. She told them, and I don't know where they've put him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Now, obviously, she knew what Jesus looked like before he went to the cross, and there's much speculation about why didn't she know who he was, right? The Emmaus Road experience, like we talked about last Easter, there was a moment where they didn't recognize Jesus until he revealed himself to her. Maybe she was so grief-stricken she couldn't see through those tears coming out of her eyes. I believe it was because she was looking for a dead body, not a resurrected Jesus. Verse 15, it says, Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? And supposing he was the gardener. She replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Now, I just want to pause for a moment. This is one woman saying, I'm going to carry the body of a grown man by myself. This is the level of devotion that she had to Jesus. And I love this moment. Jesus said to her, Mary. And turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. You see, with a single word, Mary, she knew in that moment that the one standing before her was no gardener but was the resurrected king of kings. It's fascinating that she didn't recognize him until he called her by name. Jesus said back in John chapter 10 that I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Romans chapter 10 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You might say, Josh, why, is, why are you crying so much? I don't know, I have allergies, but I just get emotional every single time I think about what Jesus does for every one of us. And the Bible tells us the next few verses that Mary then clings to Jesus. <laughs> I'm imagining she's holding on so hard that she's not going to let go again. But he says, listen, Mary, don't cling to me because I haven't yet gone to the Father. And she says, hey, I have a mission for you. I want you to go tell the disciples what you've seen and what you've heard. In verse 18, it says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said to her. You know what I love about this moment? Is it tells us loud and clear 
that not only was Mary and some of the ladies the first witnesses to the resurrection, but it tells us that, that through Jesus Christ, he can change anyone and he can use anyone for his purposes. If you say, Josh, I've sinned too much, I'm too far from God to be forgiven, let me tell you, friends, because of the empty tomb, your past can be forgiven. But don't miss the second truth if you're tracking along with me. Because of the empty tomb, our present has a purpose. Right? The resurrection gives us a hopeful purpose. As Mary runs to, to tell the disciples, we find that now he's on his way to see them, and they're pretty fearful at this moment. In verse 19, it says, When it was evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. So let's just remember what has just happened, right? The ladies see the angels. They get to see Jesus. Peter John came and saw the empty tomb. They went back home. The women come back and tell the guys, hey guys, we've seen Jesus, and this is what he said. And just like a bu bunch of knuckleheads, they didn't listen to the ladies. Can I get a witness, ladies, once again? We, you know, they just didn't take their word for it. They're, so the, the guys are wallowing in fear by the, while the women are having an Easter sunrise service with Jesus. But in reality, think about it. If you're a disciple, you're marked because everybody knows who you were and who you were with. And they were scared because they didn't want to be next on the hit list to be crucified. Verse 19 continues, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. This is an amazing moment, right? Jesus shows up. Notice the doors are locked. So this is now where Jesus just, ping, he just shows up. Just, just shows up. And if you're a Star Trek person, you understand this, right? Some of you are like, what's Star Trek? Don't worry about it. Jesus is showing up. Resurrected body. And notice he says, peace be with you. If I'm one of the disciples who had deserted Jesus when he needed me most, I'm, I'm probably going to be thinking he's going to have some correction or maybe a little bit of a teaching for me, but notice he says, shalom be with you, peace be with you, which means, uh, peace means making something whole or complete. I'm sure they all jumped out of their sandals when he showed up. He said, peace be with you. Romans chapter 5 says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you and I can only find true peace when we place our faith in the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Verse 20, having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. As they see his nail scarred body, I'm sure they're processing it and celebrating, but also remembering the sacrifice that he had given for them. I mean, can you imagine the joy and the relief? That it really has happened. Like, like he, oh, he said he was going to do this. And he did it. And the joy and the peace and the ultimate sacrifice. In verse 21 it says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, and I want us to read this last phrase together, I also send you. What is, where is Jesus sending them? Right? Jesus is saying, listen, I'm giving you a mission. I'm providing peace with God through what I've done on the cross, but now as my followers, you are called to be witnesses of the fact that I beat death. That you and I are invited in the greatest mission in the world to help people find and follow Jesus Christ here and around the world. Peter, who was the three-time denier of Jesus the night before the cross, Jesus reinstated him through his grace, and used him to preach the first sermon of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Peter said, God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. And then they, the, the world began to be turned upside down because of the movement of Christianity. You see, friends, we are witnesses of the fact that Jesus once lived and died and rose again. We are saved, forgiven, and set free to then help other people become saved, forgiven, and set free. Amen. It's the greatest mission Amen. in the world. Because of the empty tomb, our past has been forgiven. Amen. How many of you guys are grateful for your forgiveness that God has given you through Jesus Christ? Amen. 
And I don't know about you, it fires me up when I think about this mission that Jesus says, hey, I'm sending you. I'm empowering you as the Bridge Church to help people, love people, care for people so that they can experience this love that Jesus has. Don't miss this third truth here on Easter Sunday. Because of the empty tomb, our future is eternally secure. Mary, Mary Magdalene had seen Jesus. The disciples had seen Jesus, but there was one that was missing. His name's Thomas. You might have heard of Thomas. Thomas gets a lot of, everybody kind of puts Thomas down. But I think if we're honest, we sometimes relate to Thomas more than the other disciples. We say, Josh, who is Thomas? Who is this guy? He was kind of the Eeyore of the disciples, you could say. But his, his buddies, his closest friends, say, hey, listen, we've seen Jesus. Ping, he shows up. He says, peace be with you. We saw the nail-scarred hands. We saw his resurrected body. He's alive. And he goes, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. Now, I have to see the nail-scarred hands. I have, to see, I have to see the side where the spear went in. And so Jesus decides to show up. Verse 26. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. I love this detail, even the door, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, let's all say it together, peace be with you. Can you imagine the look on Thomas's face? I mean, he's, he's telling everybody, I won't believe it unless I see it. And Jesus says, peace be with you. The shock. I'm sure everybody jumped a little bit, but maybe not as much as he did, because they kind of were getting used to this whole popping in thing. <laughs> Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. It doesn't say that Thomas went over and had an investigation. It didn't say that he had 50 questions. His doubts were swallowed up in the resurrection. Amen. His doubts and his discouragement, and not only was he doubting, but I'm sure he was hurting. His Savior, the Messiah, had been brutally murdered by the Romans. And he had lost heart. And Jesus said, listen, don't be faithless, but believe. And I think with the, the reality of this story... You might relate to Thomas today. Maybe you're even here today and say, Josh, I, I don't believe all this stuff. Number one, if you say, Josh, I don't believe in this, I just want to say, I'm glad you're here. You're welcome here. You're welcome to discover and ask questions and learn. But there's two things I want you to think about today. This is really for all of us. Number one, doubt is a problem of the intellect. Meaning when I doubt something, I'm trying to learn more information. I'm trying to gather facts. I'm trying to make a decision about something. And let me just encourage you. God can handle your doubts and your questions. The, the, the resurrection doesn't stand as a fairy tale in a book. The resurrection has mountains of evidence historically, archaeologically, and I'll tell you the greatest evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the movement of changed lives since 2,000 years ago across the world. The reason that we speak the name of Jesus is because of life change. But let me tell you this. Unbelief is different than doubt. Unbelief is a problem of the heart. Where it's basically saying, I don't care how much evidence there is, I choose not to believe it. You see, Thomas doubted, but when he saw the evidence, he said, my Lord and my God, maybe you're searching. I want to invite you to read the Bible for yourself. Study it. Ask questions. We'd love to meet with you. We'd love to encourage you as you discover what's real and what's true. I love verse 29, John chapter 20. Jesus said, because you've seen me, you've believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus is describing all the future disciples like us that didn't have the opportunity to see him show up in a room that's in a, a locked environment. We believed in who he is and what he said that he did. Amen? But maybe you say, Josh, I believe. Like, I, I mean, I'm all for it. I believe God's real. Jesus died. He rose again. But, I, but if I'm honest, I relate more to Mary Magdalene. I mean, my past is messy. I had a friend of mine tell me this last week, I invited him to Easter, he says, well, hopefully I don't get hit by lightning when I show up. 
And I, we laughed about it. I said, hey, you, you're, you're welcome. You're loved. No matter what your past looks like, no matter what you're going through, and I want to be really clear today, that no matter your past sin, no matter your mess-ups, no matter your brokenness, Jesus, Jesus can save you today and remove your guilt and your pain and your sin and give you new life through his grace. No matter who you are, no matter, you might even say, Josh, my sheet, uh, my sheet of sin or my rap sheet or whatever you want to call it is so full, I don't know if God would accept me. Let me tell you, friends, Jesus is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. And the empty tomb is an invitation to come out of the emptiness of the world. It's an invitation to come to Christ. In John chapter 20, verse 31, the, the Apostle John is kind of summing up the whole book. He says this, These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That you may have not just biological life, but that you will experience eternal life today and forever through Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and life abundantly. Mary went from being hopeless to hopeful. The disciples went from fearful to fearless. I mean, it's fascinating. All the disciples died gruesome deaths because of the persecution of the Romans. Let me just tell you something. Nobody dies for a lie. Because they knew and believed that they had seen and heard that Jesus lived and that he died and that he rose again. And so the rest of their life was to praise him and glorify him no matter what. Thomas went from doubter to devoted. You find him in the book of Acts serving the Lord and serving the church. And he can do the same for you. The Bible says this, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The truth of the matter is we cannot know the power of the resurrection without knowing the person of the resurrection. See, the resurrection isn't just some historical moment. It's, it's a person. And he invites you to place your faith in him. And you might say, Josh, I, I don't understand what I need to be saved from. I mean, you keep talking about saved. The Bible talks about how we need to be saved from our sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are no perfect people here. I am far from it. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen? Some of y'all that know me well are like, yes, you are. <laughs> Probably my greatest question today is this. Are you prepared for that day? What do you mean that day? Are you prepared for eternity? The Bible says it's appointed for man wants to die, and then comes the judgment. That all of us will one day stand before God and take an account of our lives. And it's not going to be based upon how many good things you did or how many bad things you did, and hopefully you went to church enough or you said, en you know, you, you said enough prayers or you, you, you did enough uh, nice things in the community. The question of eternity comes down to what is your response to the risen Jesus Christ? Do you believe in him, or do you, do you reject him? There's no middle ground. And the reality is our eternal destination is tied to our response to the gospel today. So Josh, that sounds pretty heavy. I don't really know why we're talking that, about that on Easter. You know, the good news of the gospel is this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it tells us that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to be saved. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. You see, friends, we're already under condemnation because we're all born in need of a Savior. And that's why Jesus came, to seek and save the lost. And so if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from your sin, saved into an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's a gift. 
It's a gift through the blood and the resurrection of Christ. He paid the price that we could never pay. And that gift of salvation is free. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You simply receive it by faith. And if you're here today, maybe it's your first time here and you've never responded to the resurrection, the one that paid for your sin on the cross and you've placed your faith in him, I want to invite you today to begin that relationship with Jesus Christ. To begin a real relationship with him where he changes you today and he, he's with you until eternity and forever. And if that's you today, I want to invite you to respond. I invite us to bow our heads and go to the Father to, today in prayer as we respond to the gospel. If you're here today, say, Josh, I, I need a savior. I know that I've sinned. I know I need to be forgiven through Jesus today. I want to be made new from the inside out. If that's you today, I want to invite you to call out to the Lord in your own heart. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if that's you, I just want to invite you to pray right now with me. It's not a magical prayer. It's, uh, it's not about saying the right words. It's about your heart. Confessing that Jesus is Lord. So if that's you, just right now, Pray, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I believe that you lived and that you died and that you rose again. Thank you, God, for your salvation. Thank you for forgiving me. And Jesus, would you help me to learn how to follow you from this day forward. With every head bowed, every eyes closed, I just want to take a moment for those of you that just stepped over the line of faith and said, hey, today's my day to trust in Jesus. I just want to pray for you. I just want to celebrate with you. If you would just right now, if you say, Josh, that's my decision, my response is to believe and trust in Jesus. Would you just shoot your hand up real quick? Just hold it up real high and say, that's me. Amen. Just hold that hand up. Yes, amen. Thank you. Just keep holding it up. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just right now, that's me. I'm confessing today that I, I need Jesus and I'm believing in what he's done for me on the cross. Lord, we thank you for how you're working in our hearts, Father. We thank you that today is the day of salvation. And Father, I pray for those that have trusted in you today for the first time, that they would take next steps in their faith. God, I pray that they would take next steps to be baptized here coming up in April, Lord, at the beach. Lord, I pray for the rest of us, Lord, that are, that are already believers in you, Lord. I pray that you would help us to live on mission. God, I pray that we would live as sent people. As you said, I'm sending you. God, use us to be witnesses of the resurrection. We love you, Jesus. We give you all the glory and the praise. It's all about you. It's all about you getting the glory today today and every day. Thank you that you paid for our sin. Thank you that you rose again, that we have new life. Oh, and God, we thank you that we have heaven to look forward to, and we don't have to fear this life. We thank you that not only did you say, it is finished, but you, Jesus, didn't say, I am finished. We thank you that you are coming back again. And as we await that day, God, help us to be faithful to serve you. Oh, we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue to worship today. We're going to continue to sing out today. So why don't you stand and join us in worshiping Jesus.
of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living Could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken.
true, is it not? The empty tomb changes everything. If you experience the story of Christ, the, the good news of Jesus Christ in a fresh way today, we would love to know about that. Would you indicate that on your connection card? We'd love to experience that with you, have a talk with you, pray with you about that, answer any questions you might have. We really would love everyone to fill out a connection card. In fact, you can put a prayer request there. You can mark maybe a decision you make throughout this service today. But take the time to fill out the card. Maybe you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you've never followed through in believer's baptism. We have our next beach baptism coming up on April 21st. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Just mark that on your connection card. As we leave from here in a few minutes, just take the time to tear that off at the perforation and drop it in one of the giving boxes that you'll find out in the foyer. And if this is your first time, please take the opportunity to stop by and introduce yourself. Pastor Josh and the rest of our team will be out in the foyer. We would love to meet you today. Take the time to do that, would you please? I do want to also remind you that our service times will go back to our regular times next Sunday, and that is at 9 and 1030, all right? Service times next Sunday will be 9 and 10.30, and we want you to come back as we look at the new sermon series that we'll launch next week called Jesus Encounters. And we'll look at the lives of eight individuals who had an encounter with Jesus and how they were affected and changed as a result of that. And in doing so, that we might have a deeper walk in our relationship with Him as well. I don't want you to miss it. Make sure you come back for that. And finally, let me say this. We have a room full of people here, all right? And in order to leave and leave orderly and not um, uh, make sure that everyone stays safe, uh, for today, I would like for you to go ahead and use these side exit doors as well as the ones in the back. But take your time as you leave out of here. Uh, we have people lined up all the way to the back wall, and that's a beautiful thing today. But just be be slow about exiting today and take your time. And if you, if you are new, this is a message that the rest of our family knows. Please be thoughtful of our sister church next door. We're going to send you out through their parking lot, but drive slow, okay? And be thoughtful of our sister church next door. That's all I have for you as far as instructions.